This is part two of a, a short series which I have entitled Seeking God's Counsel. In the previous uh, message we looked at uh, specifically the uh, chapter nine of the book of Joshua. The backdrop to which was the children of Israel having moved into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the Lord causing the walls of Jericho to fall down and the children of Israel captured Jericho. That was followed by the children of Israel winning the battle, if I can call it a battle, at Ai, although there was a hiccup there because of sin in the camp, because of disobedience by one person, which affected the, the whole camp of the Israelites. But they put that right and captured the city of Ai. Uh, and then we come to chapter 9 of the book of Joshua, um, when a certain group of people, the Hivites, who were near neighbours, who were living in the land, they practised a deceit upon the children of Israel. They came to the children of Israel with uh, and disguised themselves. And they came with old clothes. They made their clothes look old. They uh, put old sacks on their donkeys and uh, old and torn uh, wineskins, uh, old and patched sandals. The clothing looked old and they said they'd come from far away. They hadn't come from far away at all. The children of Israel, what did they do? Well, they spoke with them and asked them some questions. Who are you? And the Hivites from, from Gibeon, they explained, they told lies. They said they were from far away. And the problem was that uh, in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, the sons of Israel took some of their provisions they, 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 commentators differ on this, but I'm suggesting that they, they ate with them. They, they fellowshiped in that sort of way with them. But they, the children of Israel, the Israelites, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. And that was the very problem, which then caused other problems for the children of Israel. They made a covenant and they could not renege on that covenant and it caused uh, problems, which we, I looked at fairly briefly in the previous message. Well, let's look at another passage of uh, scripture here. And let's go, first of all, to uh, in the uh, later scriptures, 2 Corinthians, the second letter, which is recorded in the scriptures to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians uh, well, we go from chapter 4, verse 16. It's difficult to come in at any particular point because the Paul who wrote the letter, he, he, he seems to go from one subject to another um, and it says therefore or for or and. So everything is, is linked with previous passages, but we have to start somewhere. So we'll start at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us, working for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know, this is chapter 5, verse 1 now, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, which means our body, really, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our, with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this uh, tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, so that mortality may not be swallowed up by life. Or, sorry, 
that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, so that we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Different context talking here, other than seeking the counsel of the Lord. But let's look at a couple of references here, which, which are germane, which are apropos to the subject of seeking God's counsel. The children of Israel, we've just looked at in, in Joshua 9, they saw the Hivites. They questioned the Hivites. The children of Israel used their common sense. They used their natural five senses, or some of them anyway, to make a, make a judgment call to decide whether these people were telling the truth or not. And the children of Israel made the decision that these people were genuine. But in fact, they were not. The children of Israel had not asked, they had not brought God into the equation. They'd used their own um, rational senses. The five, the five senses we know are hearing, sight, smell, taste and touch. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18, we are told, while we do not look at the things which, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. It also talks about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, who is our uh, guarantee. Um, now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. That's chapter 5, verse 5. So we don't look at the things which are seen and concentrate on the things which are seen and obvious before us. And I'm not adding to scripture here, but we, if we rely upon our senses, and, and like a little baby, uh, a baby is born and it, it is absorbing the world around it. it. Everything is new. And by touch, by smell, maybe by taste, babies tend to put things in their mouths, don't they? That's what they do. That's how they learn and develop and come to an understanding of things. The baby, a baby will use its five senses of touch, hearing, smell, uh, sight and hearing to learn and to assimilate every, every sort of information around it uh, to develop. Well, as Christians, we, we, we do not throw away our senses, but we rely upon the Spirit of God because there is so much that we do not see, hear, smell, touch or feel. The spiritual realm, the spiritual dimension all around us. And we need to rely, we need to seek the counsel of God. We need to ask God in situations, Lord, what is going on here? Help me to discern this particular situation. Give me understanding about this person who, who, who is coming to my life or I'm dealing with somebody or some people here. And I need, Lord, please, I need you by your spirit living in me. I'm asking you, Lord, please help me to come to an understanding to help me make a decision as to what to do, as to what to say. Because as we read here, we, the, we, we shouldn't be just looking at the things which we can see. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. We just read that. So we, we walk by faith. Our faith is in Almighty God to help us, to answer us when we ask for his counsel, we ask for his guidance, we ask for his answers. We walk by faith. We do not just rely upon our senses. In this particular instance, it's a, it's a sense of sight. I, I hope that we, we can understand that now, if we didn't already. So to recap, the children of Israel, back in Joshua 9, they relied upon their sight. They relied upon their common sense. They were fooled by the old clothing, the old wineskins. They were fooled by what they saw. And they were fooled by what they heard. The Hivites 
told them lies and the children of Israel believed them. So using just those two senses of sight and hearing, the children of Israel uh, had a problem. The major problem was they did not consult God. They did not seek the counsel of God. That's one aspect of why we must seek the counsel of God. Let's look at another scripture. It's Psalm 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Psalm 1, the first psalm of the book of Psalms, obviously. Psalm 1. And just the first part of verse 1. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And so it goes on. It talks about nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And Psalm 1, I won't read any more of it, but it contrasts the way of the ungodly as opposed to the way of the godly. As Christians, we can be ungodly. We should not be ungodly. We should be godly people. We are we, we should be holy in our actions and our thoughts, set apart. We have been set apart to be sanctified, but sometimes we act in a way that is not holy. And we can fall into this trap as Christians. We can um, we can walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We can seek counsel, we can seek advice from people who are ungodly, people who are not trusted Christians. Now, as Christians, let me perhaps just get this absolutely right. As Christians, we cannot know everything there is to know about everything. Um, I, my knowledge of financial affairs is, is quite poor. My knowledge of scientific affairs is quite poor. Uh, if I want to make a will so that when I pass away, my estate goes according to my wishes, my assets are divided according to a will, well, I, I don't have that specialist knowledge necessarily to make a will. So it's OK to ask for specialist knowledge in a certain situation. If I want to buy a car, well, I can, again, mechanically, I'm very poorly qualified indeed. And I, if I go to see a car, a second hand car, probably, I might take somebody with me who is a mechanic or who has good knowledge of cars. But if that's all I do and I don't involve God in the situation, then I'm, I'm just walking in the counsel of the ungodly. If, that, if the mechanic or the financial advisor or the person writing the will is not a Christian, therefore, and I cannot pray with that person about the choice which I want to make. So it is OK to take advice from specialists. But you see, the ultimate specialist, if I can describe God like that without being disrespectful, the ultimate specialist in everything, of course, is almighty God. And we need to seek his counsel. We need to ask his advice. So when I'm considering buying a car, for example, or it might be buying a house, it might be buying anything or it might be applying for a job. A anything, really, anything of any consequence. My first port of call, so to speak, my first base to which I go. My first thought has to be to ask God to pray to him about this particular situation to give me the right decision. And yes, it's OK to use people with, spe with specialist knowledge. But if that's all we do, then we are missing the mark, I would suggest. We are not seeking the counsel of God. And if we don't seek God's counsel, then we are... We are, we are taking a risk. We are on thin ice, as it were. And, and yes, we, we need to make sure that we put God first in all our decision making. So let's not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Let us always, as Christians, turn and seek the counsel of Almighty God. Finally, Another aspect of seeking God's counsel or, or, or not seeking God's counsel. 
uh, is in Psalm 106, Psalm 106. <clears throat> I'm just going to refer, or I'm just going to read one verse, but Psalm 106 takes us through, begins praise the Lord, and then it takes us through, remember me, O Lord, for the favour you have uh, toward your people, and it talks about what God has done in the past for the children of Israel. But of course, we can transpose this, the principle of this, we can fast forward and transpose it into our lives as Christians. And we can remember what God has done for us as Christians. What Almighty God has done for us is part of our testimony. And if there has not been a change in our lives from the before we were a Christian to the after the point when we became born again as Christians. If there's been no change, then, well, we need to question ourselves. Have we really been born again? Because there, there really has to have been a before and an after. And in Psalm 106, it talks about, it goes through uh, in, in brief terms, some of the, the, the history of some of what the Lord God has done. And then in verse 13, Psalm 106, verse 13, very sad line says, They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Verses 13, 14 and 15 there of Psalm 106. Sad, isn't it, that the children of Israel ha ha had been given so much by the Lord. Uh, he, he performed miracle after miracle. But they soon forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and they tested God. He gave them what they wanted physically, but sent leanness into their soul. And, and the soul, our soul, is more important as Christians than our physical situation, than, than our physical bodies. Much more important. So as Christians, let me just transpose this, put this into the language that we can relate to as Christians. And I'm not altering scripture, I'm not adding to it, but just so we can understand, I'm putting it into the context of the 21st century as we are now. We can soon forget the works of God. We, we cannot wait. We're, too, we're not patient enough. We, we're too impatient. We want, we're too rash. We, we don't wait for the counsel of God. But we, we want in, in our passion, in our desire to have something now. We, we lust after our own desires. And we, 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 we test God in that way sometimes. He might give us what we want in that way, but our soul will still remain in a poor state. We're still born again Christians. We still have this salvation as we're working it through, but we are not as well off. We are not as blessed as we would be if we can always remember what Almighty God has done for us and we wait for his counsel. If we ask for advice from the Lord, then we wait to receive it. Uh, otherwise, what's the point in asking his advice if we then say, Lord, please, in the next minute, please, Lord, today I want you to give me your answer about this situation. That's putting God to the test. That's putting a, a, a time frame on that which um, we want from God, which is an answer. And, th and that's wrong. So to sum up where, what we've looked at in this message today, we walk by faith as Christians, not by sight. We don't use our senses alone. We don't use our senses only to make decisions, but we seek the counsel of God. We do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. It's OK to ask advice, to get a second opinion. The expression two heads are better than one. Yes, that's good. But if that's all we do, then we are walking in the counsel of the ungodly. We need to go, first of all, 
to uh, Almighty God to ask his advice, to ask his counsel. And then lastly, the third aspect we looked at just now is that in the busyness of our lives, and if we are too busy to uh, leave out Almighty God, that, that's a sin, that's wrong. But in the busyness of our lives, we can forget that which Almighty God has done for us in the past. And we cannot wait for his counsel. If we might even ask for his counsel, we're, we're too busy and we're too involved with other things, all the information which bombards us in our jobs or whatever it is in, in which we are involved, we become busy and we don't wait. We are not patient enough and we don't wait for the counsel of God. So three aspects there today in this uh, short message about seeking the counsel of God.